Well, thank you, Michael, that, for that really generous uh, introduction. And we're so happy to have taken you away from the challenge of the bench to the challenges of the bagel, which we will <laughs> discuss today. And uh, it's really great to be up here. I'm, I'm really impressed with Portland. And I we went to breakfast across the street and was talking to the folks behind the bar. Exactly how long would the commute be if I got a place up here down to, like, could I work like three days a week? And, it's, you know, uh, last night telling me about actually being able to see the stars and the moon at night. Uh, I remember that from my childhood. I... Uh, and I, I also want to say that uh, it's really an honor and pleasure to speak after um, Elsie and uh, a little intimidating to see uh, how much good work she's been doing and I'll I'll try not to disappoint you after that impressive uh, presentation. Well, switching gears a little bit to um, specifically diet, for most of the last half century, excessive consumption of fat was thought to be the main cause of obesity, right? If it seemed to make sense, if you don't want fat on your body, don't put fat into your body. Um, most people who had tried to lose weight through the 70s, 80s, 90s, into the last decade would have been on a low-fat diet at their doctor's or dietitian's advice. And in fact, uh, the first USDA food guide pyramid, which came out in 1992, embodied this notion that among the major nutrients, fat was placed at the top, all of the fat, all fats to be consumed sparingly, whereas all carbohydrates, or essentially most carbohydrates, including a range of starches, were to be consumed in abundance. We were supposed to load up on that stuff up to 11 servings a day, if you remember that advice. Um, but things haven't worked out so well. First, the prevalence of obesity has continued to rise despite a well-documented decrease in the proportion of fat consumed since the 1960s. In fact, in 1960, Americans consumed about 42% of calories from fat. Um, and the argument at that time was that you'd never be able to reduce Americans' fat intake. But it turns out that if you tell us something enough, and if the food industry joins the battle with the introduction of literally tens of thousands of fat-reduced products, which removed fat but substituted sugar or starch, and actually marketed under the term health food, um, you can't shift the American population's consumption. And over the, um, the following 30 to 40 years, we came down to near the government recommended 30% of calories as fat. Of course, during that time, obesity prevalence exploded. Now, that doesn't mean that fat reduction was causing the obesity epidemic, but it suggests that further reductions in dietary fat um, aren't inherently going to turn the tide on the obesity epidemic. And um, secondly, long longitudinal studies, when properly controlled, really do not show an association between the amount of fat we eat and how ob obese we are. Now, it's true that simplistic studies will. If you just you know, divide the population up into the high-fat consumers and the low-fat consumers, the high-fat consumers do tend to be heavier. But who are those individuals? You know, if, or let's take it the other way around. Who are the low-fat consumers? Well, they're probably people who've been listening to government advice to decrease dietary fat, so they're health conscious, they're probably watching total calories, eating fruit, lots of fruits and vegetables, being physically active, taking vitamins and the like. So um, these kind of analyses have to be properly controlled for confounding factors. And when one does so, and we did in this uh, study from about a decade ago, but other studies have found the same thing, the nurse's health study, the health professionals follow-up study. In this case, we broke out individuals from less than 30% of calories from fat, going up to 42%. Again, among 3,000 young adults followed over 10 years, adjusting for socioeconomic and behavioral and other dietary factors. And what we found was that among whites, there was no relationship at all, a p-value at the end, um, was completely insignificant. Among blacks, 
in the highest categories of dietary fat, weight after 10 years was, was about three and a half pounds more than blacks eating the least amount of fat. But it turned out that that was entirely explained by fiber. Once you adjust for fiber, there was no difference. So simply meaning that uh, the blacks eating the most fat were probably consuming less fiber. And ultimately, low-fat diets have had very poor effectiveness in clinical practice and in randomized controlled trials. Um, in the mother of all low-fat diet studies, the Women's Health Initiative assigned 50,000 women to either a low-fat diet or a control diet. The low-fat diet was biased um, in that individuals in that group got intensive attention got multiple levels of support, were encouraged to eat fruits and vegetables, and so forth. The control group received just written educational materials. Now, it's a well-known phenomenon in obesity uh, research that just sitting down with people and bringing their attention to obesity will result in some short-term uh, modest weight loss. People become self-conscious. They alter their eating habits temporarily. And that probably explains this very small degree of of weight loss, two kilograms, uh, despite all of that effort, which was rapidly regained, such that the two groups really did not differ at all. Now, in the, um, I think, in a testament to spin, the study that presented these primary findings on body weight um, actually published in a big journal, JAMA, and the conclusion was, well, at least low-fat diets don't cause obesity, you know. <laughs> which actually I'm not quite sure of, as, as we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, and the clinical trials in childhood, you know, the big multi-centered, uh, oftentimes school-based studies that were all focused on reducing dietary fat, so catch, pathways, uh, and the like, consistently found reductions in dietary fat consumption, which did not translate into changes in body weight. So what if we've just um, all got this wrong? Maybe instead of low fat, we meant low carb. You know, it's, a, it's an honest mistake that maybe anybody <laughs> could make. Um, this was the cover story of the New York Times. Did anybody remember seeing this? This was about 10 years ago, written by Gary Taubes. Uh, the title of the article was, What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie? Now, needless to say, that didn't endear him to many of my colleagues. And in fact, the article was intended to be um, provocative. If you had a, instead of steak and butter, if you had a piece of wild-caught salmon with a little olive oil drizzled on top, you'd still be making the same point about low carbohydrate. And somehow it wouldn't have kind of got caught you know, in our throats as much uh, as a nutrition uh, professional community. But what are his arguments? Well, and it's not just his. Atkins has been saying this for many years. Um, and in fact, um, studies, ironically, you know, uh, sadly ironically, published literally uh, two months after Atkins died because he slipped on ice in a freak uh, snowstorm in New York, hit his head and went into a coma and then ultimately died. These studies published in some of the best journals in the world, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, and then subsequently JAMA, Journal of Pediatrics, show quite consistently that low-fat diets cause, produce more weight loss over three to six months than conventional low-fat diets. So it's really the opposite of what we've been teaching. And in a certain sense, from this perspective, a focus on reducing dietary fat may have not just been um, ineffective, it could have been harmful. But here the catch is that uh, after uh, six months, despite the greater initial weight loss, the two groups begin to converge. So that by a year or more than a year, at least in, the, in most of the clinical trials of low-carbohydrate diets, the groups no longer differ significantly. In effect, how long do you want to go on eating a bacon double cheeseburger? Hold the bun. You know, so it doesn't mean that the low-fat diets aren't inherently uh, effective. But in common practice, people may have difficulty following them, or these studies may have um, had trouble providing an intervention that facilitated long-term compliance. But this, the um, unfortunate 
um, state of uh, nutrition clinical research is that most trials of low-fat, low-carb diets, or intermediate options uh, may show initial weight loss for a few months, but by a year, virtually all of the weight has been regained. So what about approaches that aren't focused on nutrient ratio, relatively more fat or less fat or more carbohydrate or protein, but instead focused on the quality of the nutrients themselves? And um, turning to carbohydrates, carbohydrate quality has characteristically been um, classified as sugars, which are single units or short chains, glucose and fructose combination is table sugar or sucrose, which has been advocate, has been um, labeled as consistently bad for health, versus starch, which is a polymer of glucose, which is consistently labeled as healthful. Uh, again, the, one of the key notions in the design of the original food guide pyramid, sugars with fat at the top and starches um, of all sorts at the bottom. But in fact, this notion has, been al has also been challenged for many years. Back in 1978, uh, Volquist, an Australian, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, that consumption of glucose by itself versus starch produced identical changes in blood glucose and insulin levels. And for those of us from Boston who don't believe anything unless it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, <laughs> a joke. Um, no difference in blood glucose meals to sucrose compared to meals with wheat uh, or potato starch. So what is the saying? You could have a bowl of cornflakes with no added sugar, or you could have a bowl of sugar with no added cornflakes. <laughs> they might taste different, but below the neck, they're virtually identical. So how does this make any sense at all? It really violates everything that we were taught. If, if we were taught any nutrition in medical school, which is, it was probably you know, violated this notion. Well, let's have a look at what happens after consumption of an unprocessed grain. The digestive enzymes beginning in the mouth, and then, of course, more powerfully in the small intestines, have to work their way through the intact grain structure, through the fiber, and through uh, the, the, the structure of the grain until it gets to the starchy endosperm. Even if we chew, uh, you know, chew well a whole kernel grain, it's still going to maintain some food structure when it hits the, the digestive tract. But that's not how most grain products are consumed um, in Western cultures and increasingly around the world. In fact, grains are highly processed in which the uh, structure is uh, disrupted by milling into a fine particulate flour, and then the fiber stripped away, leaving just this starchy endosperm that is now easily um, susceptible to enzymatic attack resulting in the rapid liberation of a concentrated solution of glucose in the small intestines. And versions of this highly processed starch are found throughout the food supply, you know, from, sugary bre from breakfast cereals with or without added sugar to low-fat snack wells, cookies, crackers, chips, sun chips that are um, you know, advertised as healthful because they have no fat, um, or versions of easily digestible, or rapidly digesting um, starch. So from this perspective, the distinction between sugar um, and complex carbohydrate is not biologically meaningful. An alternative concept is that, that may have more biological meaning is the glycemic index, which isn't based on a preconceived notion about how the structure of food will affect health. It's something can, that can be actually measured. And it's defined as the area under the glucose response curve after eating a controlled portion, 50 grams uh, of carbohydrate from a test food. And since people differ in their um, glucose tolerance, all of these test foods are compared to a control food in that same individual. So it's a ratio of how an individual responds 
to one food compared to a, a control. Um, so to examine this notion and its potential relationship to appetite regulation, we gave obese adolescents three meals which had identical calories but di differed in glycemic index. Um, and a related term is glycemic load. Uh, I should mention that that takes into account differences in the amount of carbohydrate that we actually consume. As an example, a watermelon might have a high glycemic index, it's very rapidly accessible starch, uh, uh, rapidly available sugar. But it doesn't have a lot of calories in a typical portion size. Whereas a potato is, again, rapidly digested, in this case starch, but it has a lot of calories as is commonly consumed. So the potato is going to actually affect blood sugar a lot more as it's typically consumed than a serving of watermelon. So that is said to have a high glycemic load and watermelon lower. So what happens in, um, when obese children consume meals that have the same calories but differ in glycemic index or load. Uh, a high glycemic index meal, in this case, was instant oatmeal with a little milk and sugar. High in carbohydrate, low in fat. In fact, this was main, made from the whole kernel oat, so it's truly a whole grain, except that grain has been processed for instant cooking, so severely processed, and it'll also digest quickly and presumably raise blood sugar a lot. That was compared with a um, instant with um, old-fashioned oats or McCain's uh, Irish oats, uh, steel steel cut oats, I should say, which maintains the structure of the oat kernel intact. Um, so it takes longer to cook, 30 minutes, and few people have time for that anymore. It also takes longer to digest, and blood sugar stays more stable. And the third meal that we looked at had no starch at all by way of comparison, a vegetable omelet with some fruit, and that had a little bit more protein, a little bit more fat, and a little less carbohydrate. So here's what we found during the five hours after these meals were given. In yellow was the instant oatmeal, and as expected, blood sugar rose substantially higher um, than after the steel cut oats in pink or after the vegetable omelet in blue. But note that what goes up must come down, and then blood sugar um, fell, began to fall into a relative hypoglycemic range after the high glycemic instant oatmeal, um, beginning at about three, four, and five hours. Now, is that just a, a, you know, a curiosity, or does it have relevance to biology? Well, have a look at what happens to epinephrine, or adrenaline, which is an emergency stress hormone. We know it as the fight or flight hormone. But actually, of much greater evolutionary significance to humans wasn't necessarily an ability to fight or flight, but to protect the brain from hypoglycemia, which, again, from an evolutionary perspective, would be a much greater threat than a saber-toothed tiger. And we know that epinephrine is secreted with low blood sugar, and it serves to raise blood sugar, again, to protect the brain. Well, the same calories given at baseline resulted in dramatically different adrenaline levels four and five hours later. So how would that 10-year-old child who had the bagel and fat-free cream cheese um, in the morning, the mother made that for him thinking that a low-fat grain-based meal would be healthy, now with blood sugar crashing and adrenaline levels sur surging, be feeling during social studies class? Um, you know, at later in the morning? Would he be paying attention, focusing well, or perhaps more likely fidgeting, shooting spitballs at the kid next to him? And what drug would the teacher think that that child needs? You know, so it's not to say that diet is the only cause of, or is the, is the most important cause of ADD, but it, it's interesting that the prevalence of ADD has been rising as the obesity epidemic and the consumption of re refined carbohydrate has also uh, increased. And as uh, Elsie was saying, you know, what is the addictive potential of highly sugared beverages? More generally, what is the addictive potential of 
highly processed carbohydrate, not just the sugary beverage, but also that bagel or that croissant you know, that we've come to eat for breakfast so often. Um, it may be that those foods are triggering changes that drive consumption, because what kinds of foods will we be craving most when our blood sugar is low and adrenaline is high? That's a time where the, the, the vegetables, the more nutritious, slower acting foods will be least attractive to us, and we'll be craving the foods that raise blood sugar the quickest to basically rescue our biology. But in so doing, we'll be setting up that next cycle, which to me is a pretty good definition of an addiction, that we eat, we expose ourselves to something that produces an initial payoff, a rise in blood sugar, but then uh, a metabolic downside leading to a craving for that same product to again restore our initial feelings of well-being. But returning to um, food intake, we know that low blood sugar is a potent stimulus to hunger and overeating. And when we gave subjects free access to food during a second meal, they ate six or 700 calories more after the high glycemic meal than after the other two. And if just a fraction of this difference were maintained meal after meal, day after day, it could explain much of the increased calorie consumption we've observed in the United States as fat consumption has declined and carbohydrate consumption has increased. Well, we've talked up till now about how the quality of foods we're eating could affect our hunger and our tendency to overeat. But is it possible that the quality of the foods we eat could also affect the other end of the energy balance equation? In other words, how many calories we're burning off? So to address this, we um, recently um, did a study with 21 obese young adults who were studied for seven months. We brought their weight down by 10 to 15 percent, stabilized them at this new lower level, and then examined them for a month at a time on three different diets that encompassed essentially the full range of macronutrient composition. So a conventional low-fat diet, a very low-carbohydrate or Atkins diet, and a low-glycemic diet that had normal amounts of, of carbohydrate and fat in the middle. And we know that with weight loss, with that initial 10 to 15 percent weight loss, metabolic rate would tend to go down. That's the body's attempt to become more efficient, conserve energy, and help protect us during a famine. But that dropping metabolic rate also makes ongoing weight loss increasingly difficult in an environment where there's an abundance of food. And here's what we found. Um, the stippled lines or uh, columns are resting energy expenditure, and the dark columns are total energy expenditure. So we found that with weight loss, both components of energy expenditure plummeted on the low-fat diet, as expected. This has been observed in other studies. On the very low-carbohydrate diet, energy expenditure decreased substantially less. In fact, it wasn't even a statistically significant decrease when we took into account lean body mass. And that difference between the low-fat and the low-carbohydrate diet, diets was about 325 calories a day. So same calories coming in, but very different numbers of calories going out. 325 calories is about an hour of moderately vigorous physical activity a day, in effect for free, just by altering the composition of what you're eating. And the difference with the low glycemic diet was intermediate, about 150 calories a day, or about an hour of uh, gentle physical activity. And related to this, um, a study of trained cyclists given low and high glycemic index meals before exercise found that during two hours of uh, standard exertion, the subjects perceived lesser exertion um, and had greater fat oxidation on the low glycemic diet after the low glycemic meal. And at maximum effort, time to exhaustion was extended by 60% on that low glycemic uh, meal, meal pattern, suggesting that, again, the types of foods we were eating might alter our metabolism in ways that affect our ability to engage in and sustain physical activity, so that diet composition could have
effects on multiple aspects of body weight regulation. So what about over the long term? Does this notion actually affect body weight in real life settings? Um, a cross-sectional study with about 2,800 subjects with type 1 diabetes found that glycemic index was independently and directly associated with waist-hip ratio, more so than other dietary factors like carbohydrate amount. So the higher the glycemic index, the bigger the waist ratio, waist-hip ratio. Uh, a prospective study found that uh, glycemic index predicted weight gain, so that for every 5% um, five per, five increase in glycemic index, BMI increased by about three-fourths of a unit. So glycemic index can vary by much more than 5%. The full range is 100%, and a low versus a high glycemic index diet might range 25 or 30% difference in prevailing populations. So this is potentially a very big effect. Um, I'm going to just, in the interests of time, skip to some clinical trials. We did a, a one-year randomized controlled trial with 16 obese adolescents, and we assigned them to either an ad libitum low-fat diet, where we told them, uh, I'm sorry, an ad libitum low glycemic index diet, where we told subjects to eat as much as you want and snack when hungry, thinking that uh, hunger and food intake would spontaneously decrease on this diet, and energy expenditure might increase. So if this actually worked, it would be especially attractive with children, for whom we are all a little hesitant about telling them, you know, you've eaten too much, you weigh too much, you, you've got to eat less. You know, that's not a, a great message for anybody, but let alone for children, you know, concerns that it will, um, you know, cause other behavioral problems, it might set up uh, increased risk for an eating disorder. And we compared that to a standard reduced fat diet uh, that was energy restricted to about uh, 350 calories a day deficit. And we controlled treatment intensity, physical activity prescriptions, and other uh, behavioral approaches uh, between the groups. And we found that the low fat diet basically stabilized BMI for about six months. Now, BMI usually increases by a unit to two units a year among obese adolescents. So it seemed to stabilize BMI, and then BMI drifted up a little bit at the end of the first year. Whereas in the low glycemic group, BMI trended down and continued downward uh, at the end of the year. There was no evidence of that weight regain that so commonly occurs with longer term weight loss studies. Perhaps, again, because the individuals in that group didn't feel as deprived. They, they, they were feeling more energetic, less hungry, and thus you know, weren't struggling as much in the, in the battle between mind and metabolism. Um, a study of similar design by another group in adults found basically the same thing. Looking at a low glycemic versus a low fat diet, weight loss was greater over a nine month period. Um, and then in a recent multi-centered study from Europe, um, 700, uh, over 700 adults and children in those families were first, the adults were put on a weight loss diet to lower their body weight by, in this case, about 8%. And then they were randomly assigned to one of four weight maintenance diets. So one was low protein, low glycemic, the other was, and they varied in, so one, one comparison was low versus high glycemic index, and the other was low versus high protein. So the diet that was high protein and low glycemic index would be the best from this perspective. It would have relatively less carbohydrate, and the carbohydrate that was in that diet would be the slowest digesting. And they found that that diet, that low glycemic load, high protein, low glycemic, produced the best weight loss maintenance. Virtually no weight regain occurred over the subsequent six months. The diet that produced the most weight regain was the opposite, the low protein, high glycemic index. That was at the top. And the two intermediate diets produced intermediate results. 
The children of those parents participating in that study showed a similar result. Those um, on the high glycemic load diet showed the greatest increase in adiposity, and those on the low glycemic load diet showed the greatest decrease in overweight and obesity prevalence. So is this truly related to this notion of glycemic index, or could it be some other factor that goes along with it? You know, anytime we change one dietary factor, other things change too. You know, if you lower fat, you're of course raising carbohydrate, fiber changes, and maybe the number of fruits and vegetables change, and that applies for any clinical trial. Um, so to look at this, we went back to the laboratory, that bench where Dr. Didikian started out, we went back there and, um, and studied um, sprog dolly rats who were given identical diets with the only difference being variations in starch. One got a low glycemic index starch and the other high glycemic starch. And we kept everything else the same and in fact fed the rats the same total amount of calories. And here's what we found. At the same body weight, and controlled body weight. The animals that got the high glycemic index starch had substantially more body fat. And since they were weighing the same and had more fat, they had less lean tissue. Whereas the opposite was found in the low glycemic animals. They had more lean tissue and less body fat at the same weight. And here's uh, the last really technical slide I'll show you, which I think um, well, I'm going to argue that this has a very uh, important implication to how we actually prescribe diets in a real life setting. So we looked at insulin secretion in the animals. You can determine insulin secretion in rodents or in humans by giving them an oral glucose tolerance test and then seeing how much insulin is rapidly re released. Normally in an oral glucose tolerance test, we follow blood glucose levels to diagnose diabetes. But you can also look at insulin early on after getting that glucose. Some individuals seem primed to release a lot of insulin very quickly. So those are high insulin secretors. And what we found is that insulin secretion, so this tendency to secrete a lot of insulin, strongly predicted how much weight an individual animal would gain on the high glycemic diet. So that's the uh, figure on the left. In fact, insulin secretion explained almost perfectly predicted how much weight would be gained on that diet. But it explained none of the prevalence of the weight gain on the low glycemic diet. So said another way, if you're a high insulin secretor, so that you're on the right side of each of these figures, you're going to gain a lot of weight on a high glycemic diet, but you can reduce your risks back down to low, to those of a low insulin secretor, by shifting to a low glycemic diet. So it suggests that not all diets affect all individuals equally, and that if you're a high insulin secretor, and how can you tell you are? You can either do an oral glucose tolerance test or just do a waist circumference. People with a high, with a lot of abdominal obesity are typically high insulin secretors those individuals are going to be very susceptible to carbohydrate and especially refined carbohydrate. Those were probably the people who, during the low-fat diet era, were gaining weight the fastest, whereas other people seem to be protected against weight gain under many different conditions. Those are the low insulin secretors. And those are the folks who, you know, perhaps can be eating, you know, the bagels and the pasta and the uh, croissant all day long and maintaining a relatively lean weight. It may not be good for their <coughs> metabolic risk factors, but at least they won't become obese. And to test this idea, we went back to, um, to humans and did a, uh, an 18-month clinical trial with 73 obese young adults. And they were given, again, low-fat or low-glycemic diets, controlled for treatment intensity and behavioral methods. And we also, divide, we also looked at insulin secretion. And here's what we found. Among the whole group, all 73 over 18 months, the low glycemic 
group had a little bit of an advantage. In this case, it wasn't a big advantage. They lost a little bit more weight, but nothing particularly significant. But when we looked at individuals who were high insulin secretors, those on the top half of insulin secretion, weight loss was dramatically different between groups. And again, these high insulin secretors, given the low glycemic diet, lost, um, in this case, about um, 12 or 14 pounds with no evidence of weight regain. In fact, a suggestion that weight was continuing to come off after 18 months. So what about obesity-related complications? Um, this study from the Nurses' Health in, uh, study over 10 years involving 75,000 women found that the relative risk of having a heart attack was almost double among individuals in the highest versus lowest category of glycemic load. So said the other way, by shifting from a high glycemic to a low glycemic low diet, the risk of a heart attack decreased by half. Now, what drug do we have that can do that? And in fact, if we did have a drug that could lower risk for a heart attack, likely it would be found to cause some other serious complication down the road. Whereas if this can be done by diet, you know, we can have confidence that it will not have you know, unexpected side effects and might even be tasty in the process. And um, risk for gestational diabetes, you heard Elsie uh, talk about the key time of intrauterine development when uh, metabolic aberrations could lay the foundations for increased risk for obesity and other diseases throughout life. And this study uh, from the Nurses Health 2 found that, uh, again, individuals in the highest versus lowest categories of glycemic load had about a two-thirds increased risk of developing gestational diabetes. To look at this possibility, we did a randomized controlled trial with 46 obese women, low glycemic load or low fat again, that same paradigm. And um, we provided some of these foods by home delivery to help compliance. You know, pregnancy is a very difficult time to make um, lifestyle changes. And so we wanted to make it as easy as possible. And so in one case, we delivered olive oil and nuts um, and the like. And, and in the low fat group, we delivered whole grain breads and pastas and, um, and low fat um, t dressings and the like and spam spray. And we found that um, we found a couple of uh, surprising things. One is that um, CRP, a measure of chronic inflammation, triglycerides, and total cholesterol looked better on the low glycemic diet, even though both groups had the same weight gain. The other thing we found, which was especially surprising, is that the length of duration of the pregnancies was different, statistically significantly different, by about 10 days. So the low glycemic group delivered on average of 39.3 weeks, which is almost exactly the mean for a pregnancy in the United States. Whereas the low fat group delivered um, at an average of 37.9 weeks. You know, maybe that increased inflammation produced by the swings in blood sugar and insulin are giving a signal to uh, the uterus that it's time to deliver. And inflammation and uh, signaling pathways around inflammation we know are key to initiation of labor. The other thing we found is that the head circumference of the infants in the low glycemic load group was about a centimeter greater, even taking into account the length of the pre pregnancy. So it may be that um, when there's less inflammation, when blood sugar is more stable, that developing fetus can put more energy into laying down the important tissues, the organs that will be key to long-term health, including the brain. Whereas in a state of inflammation, more energy instead gets deposited into fat tissues. And we found some evidence of that too, that the infants in that group, even though they didn't weigh anymore, they tended to be a little, they tended to have a little bit more fat mass. Um, maybe I'll make one more point about fatty liver. You know, the, the best way to um, make pate de foie gras, which is, you know, kind of a 
um, in fact, I think California even now has made um, serving pate il um, illegal because of some of the, you know, the um, potentially inhumane methods involved in raising animals for that purpose. But the way they do it in France is not by feeding goose fatty foods. They force feed it what? Grains. grains, exactly, highly processed grains. Because those grains rapidly turn into sugar and raise insulin levels. So that sugar goes into the liver and under the metabolic signal of insulin is used to produce fat and the liver just fills up with fat. So we know that happens in animals and there's evidence that that happens in humans too. And this is an observational study that found twice the amount of liver fat in individuals who were consuming high versus low glycemic index diets. And we found the same thing in an animal study. Here again, we controlled body weight, and fed the, in this case, mice, just high versus low glycemic index starch. The animals, the, uh, the sample of liver from the high glycemic animal is on the left and it had about double the amount of fat as a low glycemic um, treated animal. So to summarize, short-term studies show decreased food intake or increased society following consumption of low versus high glycemic meals. Medium-term studies suggest beneficial effects of low glycemic index diets on body weight or fatness. Uh, animal studies and increasingly Human studies are now showing metabolic benefits of keeping the processing of the carbohydrate down. Low glycemic diets may also benefit other chronic disease risks related to obesity, but in a weight-independent fashion. And plausible physiological mechanisms can tie it all together. So what is the optimal diet for the treatment of obesity and related diseases? Our previous food guide pyramid with its focus on reducing fat and promoting most kinds of starches was potentially very high in glycemic index. And then we moved to my pyramid in 2005, and frankly, I was never sure quite what to make of this. <laughs> you know, it's like all the foods in the pyramid, you know, were just shaken because they couldn't figure out where to put it and <laughs> fell over the floor. Um, and the yellow stripe, you know, that narrowest stripe is the fat band. So even though there was less explicit focus on fat reduction, that notion persists because, like, what else? Like, if you're, you know, in a dietitian today, what do you focus on? You know, if you're not, you know, focusing on low carb, focusing on low fat, because we've been so trained to be thinking about nutrient quantities. So, you know, maybe it's time to be shifting uh, era away from quantity to quality. You know, uh, I think my plate, which is the current uh, teaching graphic, is an improvement with the recommendation to cover half the plate with fruits and vegetables. Of course, that quarter with grains is a big question mark. If they're truly unprocessed grains, you know, uh, some of these flourless breads they eat in Germany, steel cut oats, um, barley as it's traditionally produced, they're quite healthful. Whereas if they're highly processed grains, they're among the least healthful foods in the food supply now that trans fats are diminishing. And um, dairy is a whole nother topic, um, but it's interesting that a fifth place was made specifically for dairy. I mean, what is the human requirement for milk from other species? Zero. Zero. No, which isn't to say that some dairy can't be part of a healthful diet, um, but you know, there's potentially some conflict of interest in the formulation of these guidelines where the USDA is responsible not just for the promotion of public health, but also for the promotion of commodities. So this is a, a topic that um, you know, we'll, we'll need to think about more in, in coming years. So to conclude, without explicit guidance regarding quality of foods, not just the nutrient composition, we wind up with products like the low-fat Twinkie being marketed as a health food, <laughs> when in reality it's nothing more than an oral glucose tolerance test. <laughs> and um, my last slide, this is our version of a low glycemic pyramid. Um, we 
we don't recommend eliminating grain products entirely, but there's no reason for them to be at the base of the pyramid. Grain products are inherently energy dense, um, whereas fruits and vegetables and legumes are less energy dense and have many more nutrients per, per calorie than grains. Um, but again, you know, we don't have to get rid of grains entirely, try to keep them as unprocessed as possible. The good news is that uh, there's no need to um, focus on reducing some of the tastiest aspects of the food supply, which is the, you know, the healthful fats, olive oil, avocado, nuts, fatty fish to some degree. Um, you, know, you win twice if you cook vegetables in olive oil. They're tastier, and the kids will eat more of them. So they're not only getting their vegetables, but they're getting a healthy oil. And um, we don't have to eliminate refined grains or sugar, but I would put them in the same category to be co consumed sparingly, you know, pr ideally after a balanced meal. Thank you very much for your attention. That was terrific, as usual. Uh, Jerry Olshan, a pediatric endocrinologist here. Um, so I remember being incredibly excited by your talk in 2004, I guess, about your data from 2003. Um, and so now we're 10 years later. So I was really hoping to see the five or 10 year data that says if, if we put our patients on this low glycemic index, 10 years later they're gonna be better off than if they're not. And you follow an awful lot of patients in Boston. So what data do we have that says, wow, this is working five and 10 years out? Um, not. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's nice to see you in person because you've, you've sent us many patients through the years, so. Um, you know, the best you can do, five to 10 year truly randomized controlled trials are extremely difficult to do in nutrition. I mean, they're hard to do in, pharma in, in drug studies when the pharmaceutical industry is happy to put in $100 million into a study because they know that they're going to make a billion dollars or more from the products. There have been no more than a handful of studies um, ever done of that magnitude in nutrition. The Women's Health uh, Initiative, the low-fat diet, was one of them, although that, was, that study probably cost uh, at least 50, if not $100 million to do. Um, so we have to rely on a combination of moderate-term studies of 18 months or two years duration, um, of which there are now some. I showed you that weight maintenance study, that wasn't quite so long. Um, we did an 18-month study. There are others in the process. Um, together with uh, cohort studies, or observational studies, that can look at these effects in large populations over the long term. Those studies have the downside that they're not randomized. But they can increasingly do a good job of controlling for other factors to try to tease out the effects of, of that one. How about just long-term data in your clinic, though? So how many successful people do you have with you know, greater than 10% weight loss for greater than 10 years that you've been running the clinic? Well, the question to me about those, um, uh, of those studies is what's the denominator? Right. If you had a clinic that was based in a wealthy suburb that only took patients who could pay out of pocket, um, it probably <laughs> wouldn't matter them. what you put them on. You know, you put them on a low-fat diet, they're going to do well. You know, the clinic that we run at Children's in Boston takes all comers, predominantly um, Medicaid patients from the inner city. You know, with a single working mother, you know, trying to hold down two jobs, you know, the kids walking home from school across a gauntlet of McDonald's, soft drink vending machines on the way home. So it's very difficult to do a, a truly controlled study. How about your gut science. feeling? Do you think it works long term? <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to. You've seen a lot of these patients. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to answer. I'm trying to answer you scientifically, so as not to, you know, endure. You know, just to let my enthusiasm carry. But uh, yes, I mean, I've, cool. I've, you know, that um, clinic-based study that we that I showed you that compared a low fat to a low glycemic is a kind of a typical experience. We, I can't say that all of the kids that we see do well on this diet, but oftentimes there are many confounding psychosocial issues that I, I've never seen on a low-fat diet the responses that we get on a low-glycemic diet, where a child will come back three months later, and the mother will say, you know, we've been battling this for years, and we made this change. We just got rid of all of the processed carbohydrates. And 
You know, he's lost 10 pounds in the last three months, and he's not hungry. That's not a, an anecdotal report I've ever gotten from a low-fat diet. Great, thank you. Um, Alan Morris, another pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, you know, the glycemic index is, is wonderful in theory, but in practicality, I think, as you probably, although maybe everyone should be reading this book, it's kind of harder to teach, I think, especially when certain carbs, it's not inherently intuitive to, to people, to families, what's a low glycemic, what's a high glycemic carbohydrate. So how do you, in, in, the, in the real world clinic, teach families a low glycemic index diet? Well, I also want to point out that that's not inherent about any diet. You know, people don't inherently know what is low fat and what is high fat. You know, they, you know, you can't necessarily just look at a food and know the answer. At least you can read a label where it's harder right. with the glycemic index. Right. Um, you know, I tend to stay away from using the term glycemic index entirely with patients, except in special circumstances, like somebody who's developed prediabetes who needs really much more meticulous levels of control. I usually talk about processed food and the refined carbohydrates. This is something that everybody can recognize. I ask kids, you know, is this something that looks like it comes from nature, you know, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, or truly unprocessed grains, or does it come from a package made in a factory? And if that's the case, it's almost certainly going to be high glycemic. So just by focusing on reducing um, sugars, refined starches, and, you know, we talk about them, cookies, crackers, even the, the sugar-free breakfast cereals. Just focus on reducing those, substituting less processed grains, more fruits and vegetables, and increasing fat. To me, gets 90% of the way there, and um, without even having to mention the term glycemic index or um, have people look at numbers. That's true, although there's certain foods that can fool you, like the baked potato, for example. So yeah. it, it gets a, it's a little bit more complicated. That's right. It's, yeah. But you know, it's not that one has to achieve 100 percent. True. In fact, most biological phenomenon, 50 um, percent gets you, oftentimes 90 percent of the way. Hmm. Uh, Ron Feinstein from New York. I'm starting up this initiative in weight management, and we've talked. Now I'm going to adopt the low glycemic, and my fat's going to be okay, but I have a growing child and adolescent. When you're talking about these diets, are you controlling, are you limiting calories, or are we expecting to see if I have a low glycemic 3,000 calorie diet that these people are going to lose weight? What are you doing with calories in total? Right. I think, so the calorie reduction, a calorie prescription, is the conventional approach to weight loss, and that's the basis of a low-fat diet. That fat has more calories per gram than any other nutrient. The problem is, I think these approaches are symptomatic. What they do is, you know, you start out with hunger and calorie consumption, like this. And you say, all right, we're going to now reduce calorie intake by limiting fat. What does that do to hunger? It increases it. So how long is this going to be sustainable? The alternative approach is to focus on reducing hunger. You do reduce hunger by consuming more satiating foods, low glycemic, less processed foods, that may also increase energy expenditure. Then calorie intake spontaneously declines, and you have now a sustainable situation. So I find that that's biologically more targeted and behaviorally much easier to follow because nobody has to count either glycemic index units or calorie intake which is difficult, you know, e even on a standard low-fat so, diet. So, so if somebody's losing weight, ultimately you're saying they're not in caloric deficit, they're utilizing calories that they've already stored that might not interrupt their growth? No, if they're losing weight, they're clearly in a negative calorie balance, um, although that might also include increasing energy expenditure because people are feeling better and more active. Um, there's really no evidence that losing weight at any weight rate, as long as people aren't restricting foods, is going to um, adversely affect health or growth. You know, yes, I guess if, if I saw a patient losing more than two or three pounds a week on a protracted basis, you know, I might look to see that, you know, whether there was an incipient eating disorder or some other chronic disease, maybe they developed celiac, or, you know, but um, I find without 
focusing on calorie restriction, the body naturally loses weight at a rate that it, it needs to, and, and I rarely see the problem. Okay. A quick question, uh, just to change gears a little bit, there's been a couple new uh, weight loss drugs recently uh, hitting the marketplace. When I was at the Pediatric Academic Society meeting this spring, I ran into someone with no training in pediatrics uh, who was starting a bariatric clinic and treating children and rather liberally using some of these medications to assist in weight loss. Um, and I'm kind of bracing myself for questions from families about these drugs, even though none are yet approved in pediatrics. So David, maybe just a quick uh, forecast from your perspective. Will these drugs have a role in pediatrics in the future, do you think? Do they now? Um, and, and are you starting to field some questions about this from patients in the clinic? Well, I think it depends if we're an optimist, or I would in, th in this case argue not a pessimist, but a realist. An optimist would say, you know, we have made exciting new discoveries regarding biological pathways affecting body weight, and these are informing the discovery of new drugs that may have more effectiveness than ever before. But alternatively, uh, I think I would put on my realist, realist hat and look back at 100 years of drug failures, beginning with thyroid extract given in, in the 1890s, going up to FenFen -fen in the 1990s. Dozens, if not hundreds, of drugs have been tried, and they've all failed, either because they lack long-term effectiveness, or they've produced such severe side effects, in some cases life-threatening side effects, that you know, people aren't concerned about weight loss anymore. Um, the problem with these new drugs is that, or trouble with any drug, is that body weight regulation is a complicated phenomenon in involving many biological pathways. So when we come in and try to alter one pathway, we oftentimes get surprised at how other things push back, and the, thus the side effects and the complications of these drugs. So um, I'm thinking that ultimately obesity is not a drug deficit disease. It's a problem with lifestyle. And that maybe in some situations, we as doctors have to re resort to drugs. But we have a perfectly good lifestyle approach for most people. And that really should you know, be 95% of the issue. As we, thank you very much.